We can go ahead and get started. It's two minutes after the hour. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our January Medicare for All Connecticut meeting. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we're so glad to have you here. And if you're a repeat customer, we're happy to see you again. Happy New Year, and please introduce yourself in the chat. If you could tell us your name, your city, any organizations you're affiliated with, and then what would your Medicare for All resolution be for this year, um, whether that's at the Connecticut level or the federal level. Well, we'd like to tell you just a little bit about our organization if you're not familiar already. Um, we are a coalition of various volunteer organiza organizations, um, as well as individual organizers and activists, and we all believe that healthcare is a human right. And we've been doing actions around the state to try to make Medicare for all a reality here in Connecticut, but also at the federal level. Um, so we want to have guaranteed federal federal health care at the state and federal level. And how we've been doing that is by passing various municipal resolutions in a few different cities and working with our state representatives to draft a resolution about a single payer system for the state of Connecticut. Um, we have a board of many people in different uh, different occupations. We have some healthcare providers, some people in, that have experience in legislative situations, as well as other types of organizations. And we also have an advisory panel of folks that step in to just give opinions and advise our, um, our directives. We also have a lot of different organizations that are collaborating with us. I'm not going to name all of them, but I'll leave them up there for just a second. This really is a group effort, and we wouldn't be as successful as we are if we weren't all working together towards this um, single payer health system that really serves a variety of people's needs. So if you're from an organization that's not listed here and you're interested in officially collaborating with us, please do take this information back to your organization and see if they would like to officially sign on with us and we can put your logo on our website and our promotional materials and make sure that you're represented. Please make sure to follow us on social media or on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, and email us if you're interested in collaborating with us. We're not doing any door knocking right now with Omicron and the frigid winter weather, but we'll get back out there soon. And in the meantime, we'll hold some phone banking events um, and we have some other actions. I'm pretty sure someone's going to put our latest action in the chat. Uh, we'll talk more about that at the end of today's meeting, but please do take a moment to fill out our action that we have letting our legislators know that we are not in support of the capitation that is currently being considered for the state of Connecticut. So if you joined us in the last couple of minutes and you haven't already, just make sure to pop your name, your location, your organization, and your New Year's resolution for Medicare for All into the chat. Um, we also do want to invite you to join some of our committees if we have time later today, we'll give a little update about the committees, but on our website, if you go to medicareforallconnecticut.org, you'll see a little button that says join the committee, and that's where we do a lot of our work. We have a communications committee, a fundraising committee, education, community outreach, electoral, and then we'll have an ad hoc uh, committee that works specifically on town resolutions. So we're looking into a few new cities. Um, I think Fairfield and Middletown are upcoming cities that we're going to be wanting to work in. And we've been doing a lot of work in Hamden recently as well. So if you're in any of those cities, definitely hook up with us to get become a part of that effort. And if you're in a different city that doesn't have a resolution going right now and you're interested in starting one, join and we can help you get that going as well. 
So um, one other way that you can help support Medicare for All is by giving a donation. So on our website, there is also a spot where you can donate to us, even a dollar counts. Um, it's great to get those small donations from folks. Not only do they add up, but they also show people that there's a large number of folks in Connecticut who really care about this work. So having said all of that, um, we did pop the agenda into the chat, which I should have mentioned earlier. Um, but after what I just went over, we're going to be introducing some guest speakers. And then later we'll talk about the state competition um, efforts to kind of stop that and then uh, talk a little bit more about our next meeting. So I'm going to pass it over to Holly, who's going to introduce our wonderful speakers for today. Thanks, Dana, and thank you so very much for all that great information. Um, tonight, I am very proud to announce our speaker, Kristen Whitney Daniels. She is the chapter leader for Connecticut Insulin for All and co-chair of T1 International Federal Working Group. I have to say that Connecticut Insulin for All has been an amazing partner to Medicare for All Connecticut and really helped us set up our first legislative action that we did. Um, so the chapter that um, Kristen is working for with um, advocates for affordable and equitable access to insulin and related supplies in the state. Kristen is a proud graduate of Quinnipiac University and works full time as the Associate Director for the US Federation of the Sisters of St. Joseph, where she helps organize national justice responses. The topic that she's going to discuss tonight is PDABs, which is Prescription Drug Affordability Boards. These boards would enable states to set allowable rates for certain high cost drugs identified by the board, similar to the approach that states use to regulate utilities or insurance premiums. Um, so Kristen, thank you so much for being here and take it away. Thanks so much, Holly. And thank you so much for having me here. I'm really delighted to share about this. I think it's some really exciting upcoming legislation. Um, and let me just, slideshow up and running. Please let me know if you see my notes and it's not just the slides. So I'll talk about uh, PDABs today and I'm going to talk pretty generally about it and like what this could mean for the state of Connecticut and what it sort of means happening nationally. Uh, you'll see me mentioning, we call it PDAB for short, um, because prescription drug affordability boards tends to be a mouthful. Uh, but I'll go through all, any acronyms. But if there's any acronyms that I miss, please let me know, and I'll be sure to stop and explain them. Um, as Holly said, I'm with Connecticut Insulin for All. I've been a part of the organization. I helped start it in the state in 2019. I'm actually hit three years um, next week with the organization. Uh, it's been one of the greatest joys to be a part of it. And I think what's really awesome about our organization and really important to note is that we don't take any money from organizations that would influence our advocacy. So we don't take any money from pre prescription drug manufacturers, insurance companies. So this is all coming from our patient-led experience as people with diabetes and uh, those who love us and advocate for us. I don't think I really have to get into how vast of an issue healthcare affordability, specifically prescription drugs is, kind of preaching to the choir here. Um, so this is just one thing of many that can help influence it. I've been working on federal policy as well. And obviously, you know, there's been a little bit of a pause right now on Build Back Better. And I think that just really highlights the issue of we need federal change. Federal change is really the only way how we can move collectively as a country, but we have to rely on the state level because without the state level, we're really not gonna get a lot done in the time period that we need it. So looking at the states, what, where we can make changes um, in those areas that the federal government, we just keep advocating for. So what are prescription drug affordability boards? Like I said, PDABs for short. The way that I like to 
describe them is it's kind of like a public service commission. When you think of electric or water, the state really regulates that because they know that it's essential for people's lives and that if we start charging too much for water, we'll still pay for water because we need it. But, you know, there's just that opportunity for price gouging. And it balances the affordability needs of patients with the revenue needs of suppliers. So it's not a punitive thing, but it does recognize that we end up with these monopolies that has very little competition. And obviously the market works how the market works. And I think insulin is actually a prime example of that because there's three main manufacturers for insulin globally that control pretty much the entire market. And they increase price in lockstep. So if one goes up, then you'll magically see the other. How this isn't illegal, beyond me. But it's these kind of affordability boards attempt to break up some of the stuff that is happening. And there's so many different policies that can help with prescription drugs. You know, we think about transparency laws. Um, and stuff like that, but that doesn't directly impact consumers. It gives us information that is really critical for making legislation, but prescription drug affordability boards directly impact consumers. We can see the actual impact from it. And I'll get into like some of the specifics about how a PDEV can be set up, but essentially they're there to gather, review, and analyze the information on the prescription drugs and set an upper payment limit. And it can involve brand names, generics, biologics, and biosimilars, which biosimilars is just another name essentially for generics for biologics. So what is an upper payment limit? This is really critical to any legislation. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but there's some states that went forward without a UPL. And that means that it was just essentially a board that said, hey, this drug costs too much. And that's it. <laughs> you need that. You need that kind of enforcement. And so it's a payment limit that applies to all purchases and payments for some high cost drugs. It is not a price control. And I just want to reaffirm that it is not a price control because typically that wouldn't stand up to legal precedent. So that's really important to know. And it it does create greater access to costly drugs. So it's not meant as, like I mentioned earlier, it's not punitive. It's not saying, okay, you price gouge, so we're gonna set um, you know, taxes based on that. It's saying that there is a price for this drug that we are willing to pay up to, and that's based on your manufacturing process, how much it costs at pharmacies and distributors, and all of the different economic factors that go along with it. Ooh. I think that's it. <laughs> so what does a PDEV do? I'm gonna go over what does it do and what it doesn't do because I think those are both really important parts to the conversation because there's a lot of misinformation about anything to do with prescription drugs because we know that pharma has a ton of money that they're able to put into. So. It is an independent board made up of appointed members. You, <laughs> the key to that is that it's appointed members and you have to really try hard to make sure that there is a strong ethical policy that people aren't appointed because of friends of friends or you know relationship ties to like pharmaceuticals because obviously that can get a little messy. And their job is to take these drugs when they trigger a certain process that is outlined in the legislation and perform a study and analysis on it. So usually there's typically some staff members, then there's the board. And then from there, that's where they set the recommendation and the authority to set an upper price limit. They'll also, like I mentioned, they'll review the parameters. So, you know, some of them take the highest price drugs, like the 10 highest price drugs in the state based off of what the state pays. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that you could really look at it and it's up to the state to determine how that would look. And it does leave room for future expansion. What could it mean if this board was able to propose new legislative ideas or put forward recommendations to the governor 
and the legislature, because really they're going to, ideally, they're going to be the top experts in this field and say, hey, we're seeing a lot of issues in this portion of, you know, we see that PBMs are becoming a huge part of it. Um, the insurance companies, manufacturers, so they'll have a better idea of it. And they'll probably be privy to information that we as consumers are not. So private information um, that, you know, we might not see the light of day of much to my chagrin, but hopefully they'll be able to take that into factor. What does a PDEB not do? I, again, it does not regulate the price for a prescription drug. And again, I just say that because that's a huge misconception of it. And if that gets out, sometimes I can tank a bill. Uh, just because of the messaging around it. Uh, we put out a prescription drug bill for insulin in 2020. And before the legislation got out, before the wording got out, it was going around that it was a tax on people for diabetes, that they would have to be taxed for getting their insulin, which is the complete opposite of what we were attempting. But you know, sometimes your messaging gets ahead of you and you have to, like, it is so much harder to do damage control than it is to accurately get your information out. And some of the misconceptions are because formal wants those misconceptions out there. It doesn't deny people access to their medication. I'm sure you have seen a lot of stuff around this with Medicare negotiations for Build Back Better that by having negotiations, people will not have access. Ideally, a PDEB is actually going to increase access because you can't have access if people can't afford their prescriptions. And so in a way, you know, like some of the messaging for this is actually, this is a good thing for pharma because now you're gonna have more patients who can afford it. I mean, I know from our perspective with people with diabetes, one in two people can't access their medication regularly. And I think nationally for all medications, it's around like 24%, 25%. So one in four people, you're missing a huge consumer base there if you're looking at it from that perspective. And I, I've already mentioned the punitive charges. Pharma is going to be just fine if we have PDABs or UPLs. They're going to continue to be the most profitable industry. It's reining in some of that, those costs that are so deeply out of control. Uh, I'm sure everybody is aware and knows that, you know, the taxpayers are really fund much of the research that is going on in these organizations. And you'll see like impacting manufacturers research and development. They always say that if we don't pay the prices, if America doesn't take on the lead on these prices, then research and development will die and we won't have new medications. We'll just be stuck with the medications that we have. First of all, that means that Americans are responsible for the rest of the world's medications because they were able to enact policies that protect their consumers. But also the National Institute of Health, like the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, most of it was funded from our taxpayer money. And it's just taking responsibility that, you know, we are investors in these medications. So shouldn't we get some of the, um, the positives from it? And it's also not value-based value, pr value pricing. And this is important because sometimes uh, PDABs are looked at negatively by disease groups. Now, some of that is because a lot of the disease groups are funded by pharma and they receive much of their funding from there. Again, we're lucky because we don't have that funding. So we don't have a lot of funding in general. So we don't rely on it. Um, it's not going to make or break our organization. But the other thing is that value-based pricing is it attaches a monetary amount to a drug in a way that it helps an individual in society. For some rare diseases, um, for orphan drugs, these cutting edge treatments are life or death for people, but it's not helping a million people. It's helping maybe five or 20 or a hundred. And we don't wanna devalue that system for anybody. We wouldn't wanna take away access to the medications that people so desperately need. Um, you know, like in the case of insulin, we can't live without insulin. And yet the price has increased 12,000% since the nineties. It was a $25 out-of-pocket price. 
in the state of Connecticut, it ranges anywhere from 274 to about $400 out of pocket. If you're doing a value-based pricing, we essentially a hundred year old drug that makes sure that people who are insulin dependent live to see the next day, that should be a drug that is extremely cheap and inexpensive like water to obtain. And so value-based pricing also doesn't really work necessarily the way that people intend it to. And just a special note, today is actually the 100 year anniversary of the first person being injected with insulin, uh, the first person to be saved with insulin. Uh, so it's a momentous day for us, but also, you know, sort of mourning the fact that we're at this point here, um, but just, you know, getting down to the affordability of all prescription drugs. So these are some other key points that I haven't really gone over in terms of PDAB. Uh, some states have paid for it by assessing small fees on manufacturers. Other people use bonds or you know, government surplus funds. There's a bunch of ways to pay for it. It's, a, it's not a large amount if you're really looking at it. Uh, most of them pay for an executive director. They pay for a staff attorney. And then you know, one, two, three staff members who you know, hopefully or have technical expertise to keep the board running. It's not a lot of cost, uh, which is great for uh, states looking to pass PDEF. It also establishes a board to evaluate the prescription drugs. So you have your staff, the executive director staff, and then the board. Like I mentioned before, it's really important to have a strict ethics policy because we probably have all seen some boards that have gone in every which way because you're adding so many people. And we all, I think the key is also to keep it really small, um, to not have the board have like 30 different people because eventually you're not gonna be making decisions. Uh, the specific review policy varies by state and that, it's important to determine that ahead of time. And I think it's really important that advocates have a voice in that ahead of time so that they know the parameters. They're not gonna be able to review 100 drugs in the first year. Probably likely 10 drugs in the first year is probably gonna be ideal. Um, that'll be really great for the organizations, but making sure there's a wide array that it doesn't just focus on one disease and uh, making sure that it's just, and then create a stakeholder council for input. That is really key where I hope any state would look to advocates to make sure that that's there. Obviously other interests like hospitals and insurances and everybody else would be invited into that likely. But I, I think it's really important for states to build in like, here's how many seats you definitely have to have for patient advocates who don't violate any of the ethics policies. So what does PDAB look like in action? It's actually becoming a progressively popular bill for states to consider. Maryland is the first state really that was able to pass it. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, they did not set up an upper price limit. And that has led to a ton of issues. Um, some of it has been thrown to court systems. And so we have learned lessons from Maryland. Uh, you'll actually see an asterisk, asterisk in 2021 that they're going back to try to designate UPLs. Uh, Maine also did not set up a UPL and will likely try to go back to it. So we had 14 states in 2019, 13 states in 2020. And I think we're up to 11. 13 in 2021. Um, some of these will go over into 2022, depending on people's sessions. Um, Colorado signed theirs into law. So legislators usually don't like to be the first, but they also don't like to be the last. And as you can see, it is from a wide swath of our country. It's not just the coastal elites. There's a lot of different states in here that represent a lot of different interests. Uh, New Jersey got pretty far in there. So that's another one to know. And so I, 
I think this is progressively becoming something that is on people's radar. Uh, a lot of the state policy groups have highlighted it. And it's also something that's becoming really favorable. We all know that prescription drugs are probably the number one cause that people care about in healthcare that they care about when they go to voting. Um, and just for how PDAB and Build Back Better work, I don't know if anybody else has been hearing it, but a lot of, uh, I've been hearing a lot of, well, we don't wanna do anything until we see how Build Back Better goes. And you're like, I don't have time to wait for 10 years on this legislation. So it act, they actually work together. Uh, Build Back Better, when we think specifically of their healthcare costs and prescription drugs, what they have proposed, and we'll see how it goes, is that it would propose to negotiate drugs for Medicare plans only, and it wouldn't start till 2025. The great part about PDABs is that they actually extend to the state plans, you know, state pharmacies, uh, the prison systems, Medicaid, and it can apply to ERISA plans, which is huge. Um, and that's based off of a, a Supreme Court ruling that just came recently. It, the one thing that PDEVs can't do is uh, regulate Medicare. They can't set upper payment limits for Medicare. So it actually kind of fills the hole that BBB does. And again, does not negotiate or regulate, it would set up upper payment limits. And if we have reference pricing for Medicare drugs, states can use that for their PDAP. So if they're putting reference prices that are much lower than what we would even see in a PDAP, like that's great. That's something that we can use. We can say the federal government said you should only be spending this. And so we can go forward with that. BB also has a patent exclusivity periods for new prescriptions that they can review. So some of it is based on when do these drugs come to market? Uh, the patent exclusivity periods are ridiculous for most drugs. Insulin has like 30 different patents on it. Um, so it keeps going. Uh, they have a different one for biologics and a different one for just regular prescription drugs. States can, States don't have that problem. We don't have an exclusivity period built into PDABs usually. Like that's something you got to keep an eye on. But we could actually go sooner for that. So <laughs> that's 20 minutes of PDAB in a really short period of time. Um, it's an interesting bill and there's a lot of different facets to it, uh, but don't want to overwhelm anyone. But I think these are really great resources. And after I finish talking and close the PowerPoint, I could drop them in the chat. Uh, Families USA and NASHP both have model legislation that you can look at. Uh, NASHP also has a legislative tracker and they have a toolkit. They're both great for prescription drug reform in general. So I recommend both of them. Um, and I'll drop those in. And questions. We have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, did I miss any questions in the chat? Let me. I didn't see any question. Well, I saw a comment in the chat, so you may want to check that. Oh, what's wrong with regulating drug prices? I personally, as a human being, would love to see drug prices regulated. Like, that's great. Um, unfortunately, in most situations, it does not pass the court system. Um, I'll give an example. So in Minnesota, we, T1 International has been working on an emergency access bill for insulin. It's called an Alex Smith bill. It's named after uh, someone who passed away from rationing his insulin. And so it's an emergency fund that people can get access to their insulin almost immediately for a reduced price. Uh, they are currently going through the court system because the pharma said that they would this is the bill that they wanted and this is the bill that they would accept and then they said that it violates a uh, search and seizure amendment of the constitution and so there's a lot of different ways that regulating uh the drug prices can go but if the federal government does it it's a little bit different uh thomas i think i see your hand up 
Yes, uh, Kristen, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. I actually never heard about PDABs before. Um, so this has been really uh, enlightening. I, I guess my question to you, and I see uh, Dave and Michelle down at the bottom of my screen here, do you have a legislative champion for this legislation, legislation or legislative proposal you're talking about here? Yeah, so we, I personally don't have a bill going or anything. Um, this is something that we've been talking. There's a group of advocates that have been talking to other folks about, um, but there's no there's no bill, uh, no bill sponsor. Just something we wanted to put on people's radar that this might be something good for Connecticut residents. All right, thank you for that. And yeah, it's always good to raise the awareness, certainly. But uh, yeah. And, and we are leading into a short session, so maybe this isn't the most ideal time, but it might be good to start talking about it in some public hearings anyway, start setting the stage, because a lot of things often do take a lot of time at the legislature, and especially if you're going to tilt windmills at the uh, pharma industry, you can expect some definite pushback, as I'm sure you're aware yeah, I don't see this as being a one-year bill. I got really, really lucky with our insulin legislation. We did it in, with one year and that's unheard of. And so I have to <laughs> temper my expectations. I'm like, everything should be one year. This is a great bill. Um, but we definitely know that it's going to be a multi-year fight, much like the public option and some other bills that have gone through. Right. And, you know, certainly greed doesn't play well up at the state capitol, so... You know, you know that whole thing with insulin was just like yeah you know they brought it on themselves dopes you know if they would just you know work with reasonable profit margins you know maybe we wouldn't even have to have these conversations but when they don't here you are i just had a conversation with a legislator yesterday and they um very seriously asked me they said pharma representatives have told us that it's so cheap to get insulin out of pocket without insurance that it's way cheaper than if you had insurance. And I, we don't know why everyone's complaining. And I just, I, I have a really hard time schooling my face. Um, so I went. Oh yeah, I would, I just, yeah. You're making my head hurt, just. So pharma's already up there. As soon as they caught wind of the bill that we put, Eli Lilly came down for lunches and stuff, so. Yeah, something to keep an eye on. Amy, I see your hand raised. Hello, everybody. So California is having a hearing on Medicare for all throughout the state, correct? Is there any momentum coming from that? We sure hope so, Amy. We sure hope so. Um, we hope that our state legislators, as you, as uh, Tom pointed out, that uh, State Rep. Michelle is here and State Rep. Uh, Michael Winkler was on earlier. Um, we hope that we can push some things forward. There are champions; they've been helping us, and we do hope that you know this short session we can get something accomplished for sure. Um, at least the Husky for All study bill to once and for all say, hey, listen. It is at least, you know, for those who don't care about the moral value of it, it is economically the right thing to do, not just morally. Um, so we certainly hope so. Well, I'll tell you, I worked on the um, anti-death penalty um, legislation and it was similar. Some people didn't care about the morality of it, but they were driven by the economics of it, you know. <laughs> that is correct. Yes. There's so many different facets to speak to people about. I mean, when you really think about PDABs, essentially they will save the state money. Um, if they're buying, if they're saying that the upper price limit is how much money for they'll pay for a drug, then that's all they're going to pay. I mean, the difference between how much they're paying for certain drugs, like on Medicaid, and how much they're getting back from it is a chasm between it.
Anyone else have any questions I could answer or, and it could be generally too, it doesn't necessarily have to be PDAB specific. Well, if anybody does have questions, um, I will put my email in the chat. Or if you are interested in supporting, maybe you have some diabetics in your life too and want to join. Um, we're so lucky to be able to partner with Medicare for All for so many things and have you all as partners for us. You've been there through our legislative sessions and we're just so appreciative of it. Um, and just really thankful to be able to work with such a great healthcare coalition and healthcare advocates across the state. So thank you. And I'll drop the links to before I leave. Thank you so much, Kristen. And no, seriously, you guys are a great partner to have. And I, I would certainly recommend if you have anyone in your life who does have diabetes to certainly join um, Connecticut Insulin for All because they are really an amazing group who really support each other and family members. So. Um, I, it's a great, amazing group. Okay, so now I would like, and again, Kristen, thank you so much for all of that amazing information. Um, now, I would really like to talk to you guys about something that is happening um, in the state of Connecticut right now, which is um, this Connecticut Office of Healthcare Strategy. They have written this primary care roadmap to support primary care in Connecticut. And it's basically a capitated payment model. And I don't know if you guys know kind of what that's about. Basically, they're planning on giving um, a primary care doctor one lump sum payment per patient, which it would make the um, issue of equity even worse. Um, because, you know, those of us who have complex medical issues would certainly see a doctor more often um, than not. And therefore, a primary care physician would certainly not want to take someone on like myself who has complex medical issues rather than someone who's extremely healthy and would never see them or maybe just see them once in that monthly period. Um, so then they could make more of a profit. Um, and this is basically all about profit, putting profit above people yet again. And um, it's just really gross and disgusting. And I'm tired of people trying to put um, things in motion that are like quoted as a step forward or something different that's a change for the good when it really is not anything good at all. And it will absolutely hurt our low income are disabled, are elderly, and mostly the black and brown communities who are already in bad enough shape as it is. And this will just make that equity even more unattainable for you know, people like myself. Um, it, it's just gross. And so I certainly would uh, implore you to read up on what it is and to sign up and, and give your public comment by uh, Friday the 14th. And um, we are joined by someone who certainly knows way more about this. And if he would like to specifically state that, um, please unmute yourself now. That would be wonderfully helpful if you have more information to add. I would appreciate it because I'm drowning. <laughs> um, is that me you're talking to, Holly? Yes, Sheldon, please. <laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, I've never been on uh, just been in this group, so thanks for having me. And Holly invited me. Um, yeah, I've been working on this issue, and you know, the, people don't know me, but um, I, along with Ellen Andrews, worked on a campaign over a decade that was ultimately successful to remove insurance companies from running the Medicaid program in Connecticut. So finally, after it was really a 12 year campaign of basically for-profit medicine being the model for delivering healthcare in Medicaid with you know, very low medical loss ratios. We, we evicted the insurance companies 
and the Medicaid program, it's not perfect, but it's way better than it was. 97 cents in every dollar goes to healthcare um, with only 3% for administration. Imagine a health insurance company with a 3% administrative cost, right? Um, but we also have a lot more participating providers. We have real care management. We have patient-centered medical homes. And perhaps most importantly, we don't have insurance companies second-guessing what doctors say in order to um, make more money. And we do have contracted with, uh, we have administrative service organizations that do prior authorization, but they don't make money one way or the other. They're doing it as, a, you know, under contract for DSS based upon the standards. I give you that background because what Holly's talking about is basically taking us backwards. So that system worked whereby the state of Connecticut Department of Social Services paid the, what they were called as managed care organizations, insurance companies, paid them a fixed amount of money per member month, the way insurance companies work. And then of course, every dollar of healthcare not provided, they pocketed. And not only did it, was it a poor system for delivery of healthcare, but it also was expensive because the insurance companies always demanded more in order, they, they always threatened to depart. And of course, a large percentage, as I already said, did not go to healthcare. Um, but the capitation model really was rejected. And we went to a, what's called managed fee for service model, not straight fee for service where, you know, it's just dollars for you see the patient, you get the dollars and that's it. But rather managed fee for service where we have, for example, patient centered medical homes where primary care practices are paid extra for coordinating care. They're also paid extra if they do well on certain quality measures that are based on actual quality, not saving money. Um, so all that has been the model that's been running for several years. And uh, until recently, the state uh, Department of Social Services has kind of bragged about the success, as have the advocates, that we really like our Medicaid program. We have more work to do. People know about dental access issues, some specialists, some of the behavioral health issues. We all know about that. It's not perfect, but it's way better than it was. The capitation proposal now would be to basically say that, let's go, to, go back to that model of paying per member per month, but we're only gonna do the primary care part, right? So the primary care doctor will get, as Holly said, they just get paid the same dollars if they see the patient once, twice, three times, or not at all. So if you're a business person, and this is a model that corporate practices are really moving into, it's a, a thing. Um, if they move into it, um, they can see how they can make money. And guess what? You make money by taking all that money up front, remember, month, and not seeing patients. So what do you do? Well, you send them to specialists. You don't see them at all, but you, you, you know, if there's like a serious thing, you send them to a specialist, but it maybe didn't require a specialist, but that's where we're sending that, which is exactly the opposite of what we said we want, right? People talk about, we need to get more primary care. Connecticut Medicaid is a real success when it comes to primary care already. They get paid 95% of Medicare, which is pretty good. How much do specialists get paid? 57% of Medicare, not very good. So we already have this problematic imbalance. And now under this system, they won't want to see, primary care doctors won't want to see their patients and they'll send them out to specialists if they send them to anyone with the result that we're going to have worse access to care. And yes, I agree that black and brown people are going to be, are going to suffer particularly under this model. And I, where I work is Disability Rights Connecticut. I obviously serve people with disabilities and we can see they already have access issues. You know, some of them, they may have intellectual disabilities um, and other disabilities where the, the appointments take a while, it's kind of annoying, whatever the doctors don't get paid extra. So you can see how that would work um, if they get paid, if the doctors get paid zero. So I fully support what Holly said. I hope people will get their comments in, large numbers of comments. If you wanna know who's on the other side, so you heard about the Office of Health Strategy, um, uh, associations of primary care doctors are supporting it and some of these big corporate practices are supporting it. Unfortunately, they have also, you know, grants come from the Office of Health Strategy to other uh, groups, some a few community groups, you know, in order to get them to at least say they support it. So we do have a, a problem there. And then, of course, we have a governor who has not been wild about some of these innovations that we've worked on. And in fact, he suggested we should go back to insurance companies running Medicaid when he was running for, for governor. So that's problematic. 
Um, and we're very concerned that he will be, we don't know, but likely will be affirmatively supporting this model. Certainly the governor's office has tacitly given um, approval for it. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for letting me go on for a bit about it. No, thank you so much, Sheldon. I really, really appreciate your um, professional opinion. Um, I know how it affects me and I get so upset because it will affect me if this happens. And most of my colleagues and my members at Keep the Promise Coalition and it hurts me and I get too angry and upset and I can't verbalize everything. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being here, Sheldon, so very much. I appreciate it. Um, the next, thank you. Um, the next topic is very close to the same thing. And that is regarding DCEs, which is direct contracting entities. And that is going with the federal um, Medicare situation, which um, it is um, where they want to put Medicare and basically get rid of it and put it into private the private sector. So basically give it all from, um, you know, right now, um, oh dear God, I'm, I'm having a memory issue, my apologies. Um, hold on, Rana, can you take over for me? Hold on, my apologies. Um, I wonder if we can, uh, I was paying attention to something else. Do we have any slides on, um, on the DCEs that we can move to? Are we not seeing them? Sorry, I- I'm seeing the Medicaid capitation one. Let me try sharing my screen. So again. if we can kind of move one. through them, I think I can probably- uh, Are you seeing the cap, the- Direct contract. Yes, Medicare. Yes, perfect. Yes, Thank Medicare you. direct contracting entities. Um, yeah, you know, one of the interesting things to me of this trend is that uh, both of them, both the capitation in um, the state insurance that's proposed for Medicaid, especially, and the direct contracting entities, is that they are not really uh, being implemented by our elected officials directly. Uh, both of them have been empowered by uh, agencies that in the name of innovation and in theory, uh, getting better service for lower cost, which Sheldon pointed out is never going to be the case because the insurance companies will always take a bigger chunk away from direct services uh, using the, the funding. So um, direct contracting entities uh, aim to enroll uh, traditional Medicare beneficiaries into uh, other well, middlemen agencies. Uh, they can be a venture capitalists. They don't even have to have anything to do with health insurance at all. It's um, it's one step beyond advantage, Medicare Advantage programs. And um, even worse than that, um, in the DCE model, it is the provider, which might be your physician uh, directly, but might be the employer of the physician as more and more doctors are finding um, you know, the overhead, the administrative overhead burdensome. And they're forming groups. I know in Connecticut, I you know primary care physicians that have had a group practice are now operating in New London under uh, Hartford Healthcare. So a lot of physicians are no longer their own entity. They're already under a, a bigger company. And um, if that company signs up for de uh, direct contracting, then all the patients of, of, of the physicians are automatically enrolled, uh, which is problematic. One, one of the, uh, I don't know what the next slide is, but if you could move it, that would be, uh, well, okay, this is just a summary of some of the problems of the direct contracting model. It really uh, transforms Medicare. Right now, Medicare has, uh, I think operates 
with about 3% overhead. So 97% of the Medicare funds um, go directly towards providing health care to people. The Advantage plans are capped at, at a 15% uh, administration rate. So the uh, insurance companies can make more profit, but um, they, they frequently do complain that 15% is, is too little, but obviously more money is going towards administration than in traditional Medicare. Um, in the DCE model, um, up to 40% can be kept by the middle uh, entity and only 60% is guaranteed to be able to go towards providing people with health care. And um, so one of the issues, in addition to uh, individuals not being able to choose uh, what kind of Medicare they're under, um, it also has um, capitation um, provisions uh, on a tiered um, system in which the providers will get more money for more at-risk at uh, patients, which incentivizes uh, diagnostic coding, fraudulent coding. Uh, if, if a person, we, we had a program on diabetes earlier tonight. If someone has prediabetes, they might be coded as being diabetic and higher risk. Uh, any small trend, uh, a lot of these, we see in advantage plans already that people are encouraged to get a lot of tests. You know, someone goes for a mammogram, they have a cyst, they're coded as being at risk for breast cancer. So once they're in the higher risk group, the direct contracting entity can make more money off of them because it's a higher reimbursement rate. Um, part, one of the biggest issues in the long run is it's really expensive. I mean, the rationalization for, for many of these innovations, and I put it in quotes, is uh, to streamline, to be more efficient and, and to save costs. And uh, any of these programs that put a for-profit uh, middleman administration uh, into our healthcare system cost more and the DCE model could in time bankrupt Medicare because it would raise costs so much to accommodate the profits that the insurance companies are allowed to keep. And once again, as I started out with it, avoids Congress. There is a clause in the Affordable Care Act allowing these innovations to be uh, implemented. One thing Congress could do is um, rescind that one clause in the Affordable Care Act and, and force uh, these big changes to go through Congress. Uh, I think that maybe Representative Jayapal has uh, taken on uh, the DCEs, but um, also in Connecticut with the capitation uh, proposal that was allowed by an executive order by Governor Lamont, Executive Order 5, that also allowed these innovations to be implemented without our elected officials being able to weigh in on them directly. And I guess there's maybe one more slide about what people can do. Um, as Holly mentioned in the beginning on, uh, on the subject of uh, the primary care roadmap, public comment is being taken until 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon. And um, I don't know that we have, uh, I, and this is my question, do we have a letter going out to encourage our um, representatives in Congress to sign on uh, to the letter in opposition to DCEs? I think there is, but I don't, that's where my knowledge uh, runs out. I don't know how to get to that. Yes, Rana, we have, um, I put it in the chat, 
um, a link on our for our website where um, it takes you directly to the Get Involved page. Um, and the first action is the um, opposition to the primary care capitation. And then the second action is take on direct contracting entities. And there you can sign um, the Physicians for a National Health Plan petition um, against DCEs. They have over 10,000 signatures nationwide. There's also Public Citizens, another organization fighting this. They have a petition. Then there's also um, templates where you can contact the CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Director Liz Fowler. Uh, you can contact her um, to express your revulsion at this uh, capitalist move. You can also write letters to your senators and representatives. There's templates there as well. Thank you, and, and I do urge people to really let our views uh, known because uh, some of these problems have kind of been occurring incrementally and is getting to a point that it, it is a true threat. And at a, it, it, particularly at a point in our history where we're dealing with a real healthcare crisis, uh, I, I think that we really are, are endangered by, by this pair of uh, uh, proposals that, that we're being faced with both at the state and the federal level. Does anyone have any other questions? I think that brings us to the end of our agenda today. Um, make sure to visit the website and the social media and you've registered for this event. So you're on our listserv, you'll receive some regular updates